Hi, Hector. Hey, how are you? Hi. I thought I'd just join early. See, I did it too. <laughs> How's it going? Fine, fine. I want to make you. I want to make you wait. Did you say one thing? Hello, Joanne. How are you? Hello. I'm good. How are you? Good. Thank you. I'm. Uh... Okay. Now you are, and you should be both panelists. I just yes. promoted you to panelists. Okay. All right, good. That's better. <laughs> nice. So, so you are both panelists now. Joanne, do you want to try to share your slides? Yes, sure. Hi, how are you? Good, good. Nice to Hi. meet you. Nice to meet you. Hi, Emma. Nice to meet you too. Um, yeah, let me share my slides. Hector, are you happy to chair? Yes, yes, absolutely. Okay, what about this? Are you seeing just the presentation view? We can, well, I can see the notes as well. Um, I don't want this. Not the notes, but the next slide. Yeah, that's the Maybe full. that's here. Yeah, that's the full slide. And then now you're seeing the notes again? No, it's just a full slide as if it's a, normal presentation okay. yeah right. <clears throat> because yeah i can see the notes on my and just making sure that you can see them that's good yeah So are there series of meetings ongoing or is it one meeting per month that you have? Say, say that again, I'm sorry, I was too much. Uh, yeah. <laughs> is it a series of meetings that you're having within like these couple of days? No, 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 this is just, yeah, no, no. We, we have the updating guidelines working group. So we have meetings every now and then. Now, no. Before the pandemic, we were quite active. Then the pandemic hit and now we are trying to well no i think we're being successful reviving this because we had a meeting during the gene conference and now we say we're going to have another one and here we are and so forth and actually people here are telling me like uh yeah. Yeah, they are telling me like yes come in i was going to say um if you know that like we know that you know we i mentioned that this is preliminary right and that it has to be kept confidential because it's been screening for publication um, yes. But I think it would be also a good exercise to tell people, um, to tell people that um, 
that you know that you're open to feedback, right? So yes, of course, yeah. yes. Uh, yeah, I included the slide at the end, right, uh, mentioning feedback and questions. So yes, we welcome feedback. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. So I guess for your reference, you should know that it. Uh, it's submitted to the ANAS and it's currently under review there. So hopefully we'll hear back from them. Nice. Soon. Nice. Something yeah, we'll rejected. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, hopefully. Yeah. So um, so you know, Emma, if if you if you if I'm with you, I'll 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 say a quick introduction and then I'll I'll give you the word for you to say something to Emma. And I'd like to say hi as the as the chair. And then, and then, and then I'll introduce uh, Joanne. Joanne, how do you pronounce your last name? Kapsa. Kapsa, but yeah, you could say Kapsa. Kapsa. Okay, Kapsa. Kapsa. Yeah. <laughs> right, thank you. Yeah. All right, so let's give people a few minutes to join. Sure. So good morning, good afternoon, everybody, and welcome uh, to this session um, that we have planned for the Abating Guidelines Working Group. Um, we have a special guest today. Um, but before we start, why don't we give people a couple more minutes to connect, and then um, and then we'll start. So two more minutes, and then we'll we'll we'll, we'll uh, commence the, the meeting. Thank you. Well, without any further ado, uh, good morning and good afternoon and good evening, everybody. First of all, thank you very much for joining today. Um, we are very excited uh, that we uh, are being able to continue our activities with the Updating Guidance Working Group. Uh, this is our first meeting after the meeting that we held during the team conference that was held online in October. Um, and we're very happy that we have been able to uh, continue uh, to take action on one of 
the things that we said we we're going to do, uh, which was discussing uh, the issue of the issue and the methods around living guidelines uh, more in depth. And here we are. Um, as you can see, uh, first of all, I'd like to say uh, that we are going to record this. Uh, it's being recorded already. Uh, and if you have any, any issues with that, please let us know via the chat. And then second, um, the way you know we're using the Zoom uh, account of Jim, they have very kindly allowed us to use it. And um, so this, uh, this uh, um, the way it's set up is, is as, as attendee, attendees, I mean attendees and panelists, uh, but I am giving everybody uh, permission to talk, allowing you to talk, I'm gonna do that. I've been doing so for those who entered earlier. Uh, so we can have a, a more of a discussion um, as opposed to just a presentation. Uh, so um, you know, we are definitely looking forward uh, to your questions. Um, I'd like to give um, uh, the word to uh, our chair, uh, Dr. Emma McFarlane from NICE. Emma? Thanks, Hector. Um, and thanks for organizing this webinar. Um, it's, and it's good to see so many people um, with an interest in living guidelines. Um, and thanks, Joanne, for coming along to present to us. Hopefully it's the first of many this year and we can um, have some more discussions about living guidelines and other methods as well. So thanks, Hector. Thank you, Emma. Now I'd like to introduce uh, our presenter today. Um, her name is Joanne Jackson uh, from the Clinical Research Institute at the American University of Beirut. Uh, she, alongside uh, Dr. Eli Aikon, who all of us, uh, I think we all know, um, have, uh, have been working uh, very hard on this, um, on this um, process, on this framework that she's going to present to us today, Living Practice Guidelines in Health, a Process Framework. And she has very kindly agreed uh, to present us um, the, the results of this work. We would like to highlight something that is very important, and it's the fact that what we're going to discuss, discuss today here, uh, please keep it confidential because uh, this work has been submitted for, uh, for publication and is currently under review. It's, under, it's undergoing peer review. So, um, so, you know, we definitely want to present this to you and, and, and have your, your comments and your feedback, uh, but please don't, don't, don't share this uh, in your networks just yet uh, because of course it's, it's under review and, and uh, that's, that's one of the key uh, things to bear in mind today. Uh, we don't want to, um, you know, cause any damage to the to the publication process of this as well. Um, so, um, Joanne, uh, the floor is yours. Please uh, tell us a little bit about a little bit about yourself, and then go on with the presentation. Thank you. Yes, thank you, thank you, Hector and Emma, and uh, welcome everyone. So, I'm happy to see the attendees, some of the contributors to this uh, to the framework that I'll be presenting about today. Okay. So my name is uh, Rowan Khapsa. Uh, I'm a pharmacist with an MPH. Uh, I'm a researcher at the American University of Beirut, as Hector mentioned, uh, mainly working with Dr. Eli Al. And uh, the American University of Beirut holds the AUB Great Mentor. So today I'm going to be presenting uh, about a framework for the development of living practice guidelines in healthcare. And this framework was developed following um, a series of uh, reviews uh, of the literature, as well as uh, intensive uh, feedback from experts uh, in the area, which would be detailed uh, even further when we reach uh, the methods uh, part. Uh, please feel free to interrupt me anytime so that we can discuss. Feedback is highly uh, welcomed. And, uh, and yeah, so we'll make sure to have uh, also at the end uh, some time for feedback and questions. And for a bit of a, a background about uh, living guidelines, so as you're all uh, familiar with and uh, as you all know, living guidelines are increasingly being used to ensure recommendations are responsive to rapidly emerging evidence. And as we have all uh, witnessed during the COVID-19 pandemic, we have seen a surge in, in, this, uh, in the use of this methodology to keep up with evidence that was rapidly uh, emerging and uh, changing over time. Now, the frequent updating that's associated with living guidelines has given rise to multiple challenges that are not faced in a guideline development. 
So uh, among these challenges, uh, we have challenges related to uh, the, pr uh, the production uh, of living guidelines. Uh, these include the need to establish a living evidence synthesis process that's ongoing and maintained throughout the life cycle of a living guideline. Uh, another challenge relates to the maintenance of quality uh, despite the rapid cycles of uh, updates. Um, how to determine the update schedule and how to define criteria for inclusion of new evidence or even criteria for when recommendations should change. Uh, challenges also are at the level of the output. Um, so in living guidelines, updates uh, could be too frequent. Uh, there, uh, there could be updates showing a flipping of the recommendations back and forth in direction or what you can call the yo-yo effect. So this uh, complicates a bit the output of living guidelines. And uh, there's also, it creates uh, a problem among the end users as they are challenged with keeping up with the living recommendations. So there's also the challenge of uh, how to publish these, how to make them accessible in a way that is uh, easy for the end users. Uh, so given the increased use of rapid guidelines and given uh, the multiple challenges, newly uh, emerging challenges with this methodology, um, we found that there is a need to better define the processes of living uh, guidelines. And hence the objective of the study, which was to develop a framework that characterizes the processes of development of living practice guidelines in healthcare. So we tried to um, define the different processes, uh, categorize them, and then uh, conceptualize each of these. Um, so as I mentioned towards the end of the discussion, so the aim was to um, provide an overview of the processes, so try to capture as much information as possible. However, uh, we think that uh, more work is still needed into each of the processes that I'm going to be describing as um, the use of practice guidelines evolves and as the methodology evolves. Now, uh, for the methods, uh, we followed a three-step three approach. The first step consisted of, provide, of conducting three background formative reviews, which were um, the basis for the development of the first draft of the framework. Uh, the first review was a scoping review of the literature where we included methodological and conceptual papers about the development of living guidelines. The second review consisted uh, of reviewing handbooks or methodological guidance of guideline producing organizations for any explicit mention of living guidelines and uh, guidance associated with it. And finally, uh, we conducted analyt an analytical review of selected living guidelines. Uh, so in this review, we included, um, uh, uh, we included four methodologic, uh, methodological papers, eight living guidelines, and uh, three la, protocols. La, la Carol ha puesto en el report dos. Yes, uh, so we chose uh, these living guidelines uh, in a way to capture the variability in the methods and tools used, as well as variability in scope and topics. So we, um, we tried to capture both guidelines addressing COVID and non-COVID, public health versus clinical, uh, et cetera. And then the next step was to uh, develop the draft of the framework. And it was an iterative process. So we would uh, go back uh, to the findings of the reviews, revise, uh, and then improve the draft framework until the framework um, matured into a first draft. Now, uh, for this first draft, um, we, when we had this first draft, we reached the third step of, uh, of the process, which consisted of refining the framework through expert input. So we formed a group of experts in the field of living guidelines. So these included uh, stakeholders at the level of production of living guidelines, like organizations and methodologists, systematic reviewers, as well as uh, and users of the guidelines like providers and uh, patients. So it was an expert uh, panel of over 50 experts uh, in the field. Um, and, uh, and we obtained their feedback using uh, two 
um, two steps. So the first step was to circulate the first draft to these experts through an online survey and ask them to provide uh, feedback. Um, and then we incorporated this feedback into the draft that we had, which uh, resulted in a second draft of the framework. And I have to say it was heavily revised after the survey obtained um, really helpful comments, which really changed drastically the framework. And then after the second draft, we conducted a series of online meetings with these uh, members of the expert panel to further uh, revise the framework. Um, into the final draft. So now our final draft, uh, our final framework actually consisted of a definitions of uh, related to concepts uh, of living guidelines, as well as descriptions of the processes. And these processes included the planning, production, reporting, dissemination, and accessibility of living guidelines. And during the next slides, I'll, I'll go over the definitions and then um, figures uh, describing the different processes. So starting with the definitions, uh, after heavy uh, input from the experts, uh, we, uh, we ended up with uh, proposed definitions for the living recommendation and a living guideline. So before going into the details, just to mention that we base the definition of a living guideline on that of a living recommendation. As you can see, uh, the, the underlying text is the same across the two um, definitions, uh, showing how much the definition of a living guideline relies on the definition of a living recommendation. Because one um, main aspect of our framework it was the focus on the living recommendation, and the living recommendation being of update in living guidelines and not necessarily uh, the whole guideline. So the living recommendation would be the living recommendation and then the living guideline would simply be a collection of one or more related recommendations. Now going into the details of the definitions, uh, a living re recommendation uh, was defined as a recommendation that is kept current by an optimized guideline updating process that counts potentially consequential evidence as soon as or shortly after it becomes available. Now, in this definition, uh, we and experts wanted to highlight the, the currency aspect of living guidelines, uh, the optimized process as compared to the traditional guideline updating, uh, as well as uh, having this process account for uh, potentially consequential evidence, meaning evidence that could have an impact on the recommendations and that is integrated as soon as, or sometimes with a, with a bit of a lag, which is shortly after this evidence becomes available. Now for a living guideline, um, it's simply a guideline that includes one or more related recommendations that are kept current by this optimized guideline updating process. And the last point is, uh, is just to repeat that the unit of update in a living guideline is the, the, the individual recommendation and not necessarily the whole guideline. Um, now, as far as definitions, we have two additional definitions, uh, one for living mode parameters and another one for revisiting a recommendation. So um, we felt that there is a need for a definition for living mode parameters. We felt these are um, aspects that characterize the, the living process and uh, we felt that they deserve to be uh, defined and uh, so have their place uh, among the definitions. Uh, so to us, living mode parameters are a methodological aspects that characterize the living process. And so more specifically, these include the frequencies of conduct of specific steps of the process or any triggers for conducting those steps prior to schedule. So for example, uh, a living mode parameter either be a specific frequency uh, that is preset for assessing a body of evidence or triggers for uh, assessing the body of evidence such as uh, for example saying with any new study that meets eligibility criteria and you would have living mode parameters for 
um, virtually all of the steps like uh, parameters for the search, parameters for uh, assessing the body of evidence, parameters for the revisiting of the recommendation. Now for revisiting a recommendation, and um, as you will see throughout this framework, we try to uh, shy away from the word uh, updating uh, because um, of the different uh, understanding uh, related to this term. So we're discussing with the expert panel and um, looking at their feedback. So some of um, the members of the panel, to them updating was the whole cycle, such Search and then assessing the body of evidence and then revisiting the recommendation. For other members, it was the step um, at which the panel is reconvened to reissue or rediscuss a specific recommendation. So for, for others, it was uh, whenever you have a change in a recommendation, they would consider it as updated, while if you don't have a change, um, they would not consider it as updated. So we tried to shy away from this word and just label each as it is. And um, so as a result, we, we just labeled the step where the panel reconvenes to discuss a certain recommendation as revisiting a recommendation. So it consists of reconvening the guideline panel to discuss the impact of a potentially consequential change in the body of evidence. So meaning the, the living evidence review would have um, identified uh, maybe new studies uh, that uh, uh, and as a result of these, they would judge that uh, these new studies might potentially uh, result in a change in a recommendation. So this is where the panel comes together and discusses this potentially consequential change to judge if it will um, eventually result in a change or not in the recommendation statement. And just to mention that uh, whenever we talk about the living evidence synthesis or the body of evidence, uh, we wanted to highlight that uh, these are the, so the evidence is, uh, refers to both evidence on health effects uh, as well as evidence on contextual factors because um, so although the recommendations could change uh, based on a change in the effects of a certain intervention they could also change based on the contextual factors like availability of of a certain intervention acceptability and we have seen this with the mass the vaccination uh, recommendations in the context of COVID so which uh, were affected by uh, for example availability okay just looking at the chat okay thanks Hector so now uh, moving on to uh, the uh, the description of the processes and uh, and this uh, would be done uh, through the different figures uh, covering the processes that we have identified so we have the planning the production the reporting and dissemination process and acceptability now starting with the first figure uh, in which we conceptualize the planning of a living uh, guideline um, so after a careful review of the literature and feedback from experts, we propose to conceptualize the planning of living guidelines as a planning that, that happens at two levels. So the first level would be the what we are calling the organizational level. So this is where a specific organization decides to adopt the living guideline methodology or to enter the living, uh, living guideline enterprise. So this is not related to yet a specific project, it's just the organization uh, deciding to enter uh, this enterprise to adopt this methodology and to make uh, the necessary changes in its handbook, uh, in its committees, um, etc., to be able to accommodate for this methodology. And then the second level would be at the level of the specific guideline, um, which would uh, be repeated with uh, each uh, living guideline, while the organizational um, level would be more constant done once, uh, plus or minus, so going back to it uh, uh, to modify it, but not as frequently as um, with a sp uh, each specific living guideline. So now under the organizational adoption of the living methodology, uh, so we have... Um, identified the following steps, and this is how we would conceptualize this organizational adoption. 
So first, the there would be a trigger for a specific organization to consider the living mode. And this is, uh, for example, a demand from, from the target audience of the organization for, um, for, uh, for uh, the production of a living guidelines. Um, then in response to this trigger, the organization would assess its readiness uh, to enter the living guideline enterprise, and this includes readiness in terms of human resources, expertise needed, as well as financial resources, because um, so living guidelines would need uh, um, significant resources in terms of their production and their maintenance. So I'm seeing a comment from Per for discussion later. So yes, maybe we'll come back to it. Um, we'll come back to it at the end of the session. Thank you. Um, so the next step would be to establish uh, structures and processes. Uh, so the structures in that case include the committees uh, or modification of existing committees to, to be able to account for the living methodology, as well as processes like the handbook of the organization. And between the steps of readiness and the structure, we have included this uh, feedback loop. Uh, uh, and, and I have to say this feedback loop was requested by the experts for more than, than one step. And uh, so it's showing how this uh, process is iterative. So maybe after you establish the structure and processes, you would need to come back, reassess your readiness, and according to this readiness, change uh, in the structure and processes. And then a fi the final step in, in the planning uh, at the organizational level would be ideally to prioritize uh, topics for the living mode. And this step may be uh, also revisited over time. Now, at the level of a specific guideline, um, we identified the following steps, which include the development of a protocol. So here we're talking about the methods specific to that living guideline, and the protocol would ideally include the living parameters. And then assessment of the capacity for and sustainability of uh, a single project. So as opposed to the readiness as a whole of an organization. So it's assessing the resources um, that an organization has in order to be able to sustain a specific project. Uh, the next step would be to form the living working groups. The, and as you can see by, by like the refresh icon uh, around the step, uh, the living group, this step may be revisited because as PICO questions um, are prioritized and deprioritized within a specific guideline, the types of expertise might change. You might need additional expertise in certain areas. And this is why you would need to revisit your living working groups, recruit additional individuals as needed. It could be the don't have the time capacity anymore at some point. So, uh, and this is why we're calling them living working groups. And then uh, the next step would be to prioritize uh, PICO questions. So here within a specific topic, um, prioritizing questions to uh, develop recommendations for. And then we have a small icon next to prioritize questions, which indicates the, that the panel is usually engaged uh, in the so um, after the planning for living guidelines, uh, the next process that we have identified and concept conceptualized is a production of living guidelines. So the figure might be a bit overwhelming at first to look at. Uh, I'll just highlight some uh, general aspects uh, and then we, we will go back we'll go into more details. So first of all, maybe the first thing that strikes is coil uh, shape uh, that we have used. So we've decided to move away from this uh, cyclic uh, process uh, where sometimes it's not clear what, where it begins, where it ends. And also the cyclic process assumes that it's a never ending process. Um, while uh, we found that in living guidelines, uh, at some point for a specific recommendation, it could be retired from the living mode and it 
uh, we also start at a certain phase. So we have an initiation phase and we could have a retirement phase uh, marking the start and the end of, if you want to call it the life cycle of a specific recommendation. So this is why we felt that the coil, this coil uh, shape process uh, is more suitable to conceptualize the production of a living recommendation. It shows that you have some steps that are being repeated but then there's a start and there's an end. So as I mentioned, the start would be the initiation of the living mode, which we present in the green colors. So we have three main phases, initiation, maintenance in the orange color, and then uh, the retirement phase. Now going um, into uh, more uh, details uh, and uh, looking closer at the picture, uh, the blue uh, big arrows uh, show the time dimension. They show ongoing processes like the living evidence synthesis Um Now going into the initiation, um, the initiation starts with a prioritized PICO question. And here we're talking about one question because this figure conceptualizes the production process of a single recommendation. So we start with a one prioritized PICO question for which we set the living parameters. And then uh, we have the living evidence uh, synthesis process that would be happening. So in the initiation phase, you would set uh, the, the surveillance or so the literature search, auto alerts, any strategy that you would be using. Uh, you would assess for the first time the body of evidence, which here also includes evidence on health effects and contextual factors. And following this, uh, the organization would, um, uh, this would result in a draft of the recommendation. So this is the first version or the base version of a certain recommendation, which would be disseminated and will cover dissemination in the next uh, figures. And potentially we can have a step where there is uptake and impact evaluation of a recommendation. So that's uh, that would be the initiation of the living mode and as you can see uh, below the initiation uh, loop we have recommendation version one that uh, would be the result of the initiation phase now moving into the maintenance phase that specific recommendation uh, it could be that this recommendation is revisited uh, so while you revisit uh, the PICO question, you could uh, decide to change uh, some elements, add out, uh, uh, change a bit in your intervention, maybe split the PICO question, merge PICO questions together. So revisiting of the PICO question could happen uh, sometimes during the maintenance. Uh, and then you could revisit the living mode parameters that you have set at the beginning. So maybe change certain triggers, certain frequencies for conducting things. And here's, so what's interesting in, in living guidance is that you have the recommendation or the final output that's changing, but also the method, methods that are, that are changing. And in addition to revisiting the living mode parameters, you would here revisit um, some of your methods as well. So it could be that you can change in your eligibility criteria. So let's say at the beginning, you were including um, randomized and non-randomized studies, but then as you progress, you might reach a higher certainty of evidence and you might decide to drop the non-randomized studies. Um, at some point during the process, you could discuss the inclusion or exclusion of preprints. So, Methodological aspects can also be changed during maintenance. Uh, and then you would move to uh, the process of uh, surveillance. Um, and then uh, instead of the first assessment of the body of evidence, there would be a reassessment of the body of evidence as needed. So it's usually when new studies are identified. And as a result, you have a revisit of the recommendation. So also um, as needed. And as you can see, um, so here in the big uh, the rectangle, uh, in the next figure, we will expand on, um, on how to move from surveillance to assessing the body of evidence and uh, revisiting the recommendations. And what are some factors to consider for when moving um, from one step to the other? Uh, and then a final outcome be that uh, you would revisit the PICO question, but at that point this, uh, decide that uh, the PICO question does not meet uh, the criteria for the living mode anymore. 
So it's usually when a recommendation, you would judge that it has become stable enough, like when you reach a high uh, level of certainty of evidence or uh, a strong recommendation, you might decide uh, to retire this recommendation from the living mode. So the recommendation here would be valid, uh, would still be valid, but would not be updated using the living uh, mode. So perhaps it could go back to the regular uh, updating mode. So now uh, in the next figure, just going over some, some scenarios uh, when, when moving uh, between the steps of surveillance, assessing the body of evidence and revisiting recommendations. Uh, okay, so but just before moving to this figure, uh, we wanted to highlight by this yellow arrow at the top uh, that uh, there are also ongoing processes uh, that need to be uh, kept in mind, like COI management. So it, it, it has to be a living process. And so perhaps it needs to be repeated at every cycle. Uh, quality control is an ongoing process, stakeholder engagement. So you, um, there's a need to consider how this can be maintained throughout uh, the, the living guideline uh, process. And then the sustainability assessment would, would be ongoing. And uh, have, uh, we have also included crediting contribution here because as individuals are added or removed from the group, authorship might change, acknowledgements uh, might change, and it's just something to keep in mind. So now going over the, the different scenarios uh, within the loop. So now we're going to zoom into the loop and um, just expand a bit on, on the steps of the maintenance. So. Um, Following surveillance, uh, you could have uh, different outcomes. So in scenario one, it could be that, uh, so you would need to ask yourself or the producer, is there any new evidence identified? Now, if there is no new evidence, uh, so this would automatically mean that there's no change in the body of evidence or in recommendation that is needed. And what you would move to is just uh, to the dissemination process. And here we could think about reporting, for example, the latest state of surveillance. So saying that this recommendation is, um, is recent as of uh, the date of the surveillance. Uh, so as part of the dissemination in that scenario. Now, the second scenario would be uh, if you find new evidence uh, following surveillance. So in that case, a reassessment of the body of evidence um, usually follows. And, uh, and uh, following input from, from experts, um, there was an interesting point raised here about uh, this reassessment of the body of evidence. So it could be just informal, informally looking at, at the studies and looking at the existing body of evidence and assessing whether um, there, there is a potentially consequential change on the recommendation. Uh, or a form, more formal process like a formal integration of the studies in the body of evidence, reassessment of the certainty and the conclusions, and then uh, an, an assessment about whether there is uh, this new evidence results in a potentially consequential change on the recommendation. Now, if the judgment is that no, uh, the, the new body of evidence identified is sufficiently maybe consistent with the body of evidence that we have, and we do not suspect that it would have a potentially consequential effect on the recommendation, uh, we would proceed with dissemination. And here, in addition to the latest, uh, so to the date of evidence surveillance, we could uh, add a report of the outcome uh, of the review process. So the studies that were added, an updated evidence summary, uh, updated evidence profile, uh, et cetera. And then uh, the third scenario is when uh, there is a potentially consequential change. So, so we judge that there is a potentially consequential change uh, that results in the body of evidence. Uh, so in that case, the organization might elect to uh, reconvene um, the panel in order to revisit the recommendation. And in that case, dissemination would include all of uh, the other elements that we already talked about, like uh, timestamp for the surveillance, uh, the outcome uh, of the review, as well as the revisited recommendation. So 
So it could be that the recommendation was revisited, revisited but the panel decided that no change is needed or uh, reporting on the changes. So um, in the next figure, we'll, uh, we'll talk more about the dissemination process and, uh, and the linking it to the reporting of, of a certain recommendation. So figure four at the left side starts with the reporting elements that I just mentioned, like the evidence surveillance, the outcome of the reassessment of the body of evidence and of the recommendation revisit. Uh, so this is just to show that uh, you could have different combinations of these elements. So maybe having the evidence surveillance timestamp, but without the full report of the body of evidence, and uh, with the outcome of recommendation revisit, for example, going into uh, a certain dissemination venue, while in another dissemination venue, you could have the full report of the body of evidence with the full report of the recommendation revisit and all of the changes go in another venue. So different combinations go into different uh, formats and different venues. Uh, so which brings us to the right hand side of this figure, which is the dissemination. Uh, as you can see, we have included um, multiple venues, venue one, two, to venue N. So for example, venue one could be the last of the organization. Venue two could be the peer reviewed publication. Uh, venue N could be the online platform like Magic App. And uh, just to show that, uh, that uh, one guideline uh, or the outcome of, of one revisit could be published in different venues. And uh, we have um, shown here the time element and uh, showing a bit that there could be a lag between venues. So maybe first online platform and the website, but then uh, because of the peer review process, the peer review publication might take more time to become available. And uh, so here, this brings with it uh, many challenges at the production side. So for the producers, um, how to uh, include different uh, reporting elements and different venues, how to ensure that they are published almost uh, simultaneously and made available to the users. And it also raises, raises some challenges at the end user's perspective, so which is linking between the different venues, so having pieces of information in the different venues. And we propose that ideally um, uh, there, there would be a link between uh, the different venues for, for the users to be able to access more easily the guidelines and follow a certain living guideline. Uh, so uh, we have split or conceptualized the dissemination into two um, elements. So the first one, which, uh, which I covered, is, is, is more about pu publication. And then there's another uh, aspect of dissemination, which we call raising awareness. And this is more of the active dissemination that the organization does, like tweets, email blasts, to raise awareness of the guideline. And then here, as you can imagine, they could be really brief messages uh, having a brief um, reporting elements. So from the full report to these uh, small uh, announcements or active dissemination messages. Uh, so next, uh, as part of the framework, also we've included uh, just an example of how a living recommendation could be reported and how the, these different reporting elements can be integrated. So maybe in addition to uh, the, uh, the standard recommendation format showing the PIC elements and uh, the direction, the strength and the certainty of the evidence, we could include the evidence, uh, that, so the date of the most recent uh, evidence surveillance as a timestamp, uh, the outcome of the recommendation revisit, if any. So um, users might want to, to have this information up front, and producers might want to publish this type of information along with the recommendation statements. Uh, including um, also a point whether about whether this version is the latest, because due to the different version, the user uh, might uh, might uh, stumble upon uh, a version of recommendation that is simply not the latest. So ideally, we, we would uh, want uh, any version that is not current to indicate that this is not the latest version. 
And in addition, um, uh, to also link to the latest version of a certain recommendation, which is the last, uh, the last point that we have. Now, uh, for the last uh, aspect of our framework, which relates to acceptability, uh, sorry, accessibility of the guidelines, I'll try to be a bit brief just to keep enough time for the discussions on seeing the, the chat. Uh, so it's about the versioning and acceptability of a living practice guideline. And here it's a bit of a, of a zoom out from the earlier figures because the earlier figures mostly uh, addressed one specific recommendation. So here we zoom out and you can see how um, the recommendations uh, are the forming parts of a guideline. Uh, we have guideline versions 1, 2, N. And uh, as we can see in the different uh, versions we have, so for example, recommendation A um, in green showing that it was, it was a new recommendation. So created in guideline version one, it would be uh, maintained uh, across versions and maybe at some point retired. So for recommendation D, uh, which wasn't present in guideline version one, it would have been created in guideline version two. Maybe it came from a split in a certain PICO. Maybe it, uh, it was uh, prioritized at that, uh, at that point in time and then maintained uh, throughout the process. And uh, so this laying of the recommendation and this layout of the recommendations and of the guidelines allows us to, um, to, to distinguish between uh, two views which are the recommendation view and the guideline view. So what you have at the top, um, so the horizontal line uh, is, pertains to the recommendation view where a certain user can see the most recent version of a recommendation plus the earlier versions of that recommendation or if you want the recommendation history. And then uh, we have another uh, view, which is the guideline view in which a certain user can see all of the most recent versions of each recommendation in a specific guideline. And uh, so we debated about whether which view is, is better, which would be more efficient. The conclusion that we kind of reached is that uh, it would depend on, on the user. So maybe a guide, uh, a clinician on the go would, would just want to see the most recent versions of all recommendations in one place in one document, while um, maybe a methodologist that would like to study changes in recommendations over time or a clinician interested in a specific recommendation would uh, prefer the recommendation view at some point. Ideally, we would reach a point where uh, the publication venues would allow for both of these views in an easy and accessible manner. So just to end, um, uh, a few discussion points. Uh, to mention that this framework builds on the GINMAC Master Guideline Development Checklist. And we're mentioning this because we think that uh, this framework focuses on aspects that are specific to living guidance or particularly but the other aspects uh, would still hold. So the other aspects of the regular guideline development uh, described in the John McMaster guideline development checklist. Um, we think that the framework can help guideline developers in both planning and conducting their living guideline uh, projects. And it can also help, so that's from a practical side, but it can also help to study the method of conducting, reporting, and disseminating the practice guidelines. So because it's from it provides kind of a conceptualization of, um, of the different processes involved. And then we think that further development and research uh, is needed to address uh, details of, of this uh, process, like the certain triggers, what are they, uh, how to set them, um, so, so all of the, the discussion points uh, that were raised. Just for acknowledgements, I would like to acknowledge the, the core team, uh, which have uh, worked uh, really hard on this publication, but also the Living Guidelines group, uh, which is the group of experts uh, without their input. So the framework would have been uh, totally different. So also thank you for their uh, involvement. Uh, so I'll open it for feedback and questions. Well, thank you very much, Thank you.
Thank you very much for having me. Yes, well, thank you very much for this very comprehensive uh, presentation. Uh, thank you also to Eddie and to the rest of the team. And at this point, we'd like to take your questions. Uh, please, please go ahead. Um, you know, I'd like to start up with a first uh, comment. Um, you know, he says for discussion, uh, other factors other than the body of evidence uh, that may warrant revisiting a recommendation uh, which fits the ETD, but goes beyond evidence um, as we know it uh, more practically. For example, a, a new drug being approved or removed for use uh, based on ACA processes. Um, so, you know, there are many different drivers for updates in the guidelines. So thank you, Pedro, for this very interesting comment. Um, if you want to go ahead and say a little bit more, uh, or yours, Pedro. Otherwise, anybody wants to intervene, uh, please go ahead. Yeah, well, thanks, Hector. And, and thanks most of all to Joanne and the team. Wonderful work, really impressed. It's gonna be extremely helpful in the space of living guidelines. Um, so I think my comment was just a, a detail uh, that when we talk about uh, living guidelines and we are pretty focused on methods and grade and the body of evidence, we've learned through our early efforts before COVID in MAGIC um, that there are actually a lot of different, more practical issues that would trigger a uh, change in recommendations and living guidelines. But I think you you agree, Joanne. Uh, since you're nodding, let me bring up a few other things. Uh, yes, I think again, this is just wonderful work. And uh, one of the things I'm curious about is how you define when you come up with these new definitions of living recommendations and living guidelines to operationalize uh, you know, what we mean by an updated recommendation, you say, I think consequential uh, change. Did you discuss or have any more insights into how to define this? So, I mean, traditionally it's been like changing the strength or direction of recommendations, which is quite pragmatic, but also easy to conceptualize. But I think we see now from COVID and WHO uh, living guidelines that even a change in the condition for recommendation, like we now have for an antibody with the, the Omicron variant, would classify as an updated recommendation. Actually, we're struggling with this now. So I'm curious, curious about the insights from your work and how to define or operationalize consequential change or, yeah. Yes, yes, thank you, Per. So a very important point, and it's, it came up during the discussions, and uh, I think this is an area where, uh, where further research is, is needed to define these. So as you mentioned, we have the, the traditional uh, uh, certainty in the evidence uh, um, of the desirable and undesirable effects, uh, the contextual factors uh, perhaps changing. Um, maybe the the estimates the the size of, of the estimates uh, might uh, might result in a consequential change or not but uh, yeah so this is this is mainly what we thought about so most of the factors you've already mentioned but as you're suggesting that there, there might be more and uh, and further research might might help with these yeah i agree and then Hector, I'm sure there's others who want to ask questions. I have more, but let's let the others chime in. I'll, I'll go back to you, Per. Um, Sarada, uh, you say, how have implementation considerations been reflected in the development of this model? Uh, Sarada, would you like to elaborate a little bit more on your question? Well, actually, I think, I think she's left. So uh, join. Um, interpretation <laughs> considerations. Okay, so uh, yes. go ahead, Jen. Yeah, not sure if uh, if uh, uh, so. We're, you're talking about the comment about Sarada uh, in the chat. I'm not sure if uh, if it's about implementation of of the actual uh, processes, so at the production side or implementation after production. I think it's more about after uh, production of certain recommendation. Uh, so we've uh, covered it briefly uh, by the step of uh, uptake and impact evaluation. But, uh, but yeah, I would say that's an area where, uh, where more, uh, more, more research uh, could be made. So how to, 
account for for the for a changing guideline, for example, when 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 implementing after each version and each revision. Yeah, I like to. I like to just you know something I wanted to say uh, to the comment that Per made before um, on potential triggers uh, for revisiting a recommendation and then from previous work. And I just want to mention this, uh, you know, as a brainstorming in case you are considering about this to, to all of all of us here. Um, you know, we detected in previous work for the app priority tool um, the impact of uh, of an updated recommendation on safety. Also, uh, contextual uh, factors such as burden of disease, um, variation in clinical practice, um, or the emerging of new care options. Uh, also, um, any changes in any of the people components, for instance, outcomes, uh, which can be elicited from um, changes in uh, the interests and the values and preferences of users. Uh, also, uh, increase uh, or uh, more, more interest on, on, the, on behalf of users on a particular aspect of the recommendation and then impact on equity and access to healthcare. So these are just more options to be considered. Um, ben, um, back to you. <laughs> Thanks. Uh, yeah, so one of the other things we're struggling with um, in our work with living guidelines is the intersection between living systematic reviews and living guidelines. I'm sure you know about this, John, from your center, you've done living reviews from way back. And one of the things we learned is that um, the living systematic review ideally should be informed by the needs from the guideline panel. So for instance, with WHO, where we support them on the methods and process side, we make sure that the living NMA from McMaster is done according to the PICO questions from the panel. And we think this is quite crucial to enhance uh, the relevance and trustworthiness of the guideline itself. So did you cover the, this intersection between the living reviews and the living guidelines in, your, in the framework development? Um, yes, so uh, it was addressed as, as part of, of these, so the different scenarios, what happens when you find new evidence, et cetera, but, uh, but there is uh, more to that, uh, as you're mentioning. Um, yes, so the, the close uh, involvement of the panel and the systematic review process would be ideal. So having this, the living systematic review going in parallel with uh, the living guideline, so it would even uh, impact how, um, how uh, evidence is graded, so because it would uh, be defined by how the, the panel is judging a clinically significant effect and uh, so other factors. Um, yeah, so what I would add, so what came up during the discussions, but uh, that we uh, did not conceptualize was um, the whole uh, evidence uh, ecosystem, if you want, and the living guidelines coming as part of this evidence ecosystem. And, uh, and there was the issue uh, raised of having, for example, one living guideline using evidence from multiple living systematic reviews. And so, so how would this collaboration happen uh, between them and the different organizations? So this is more of, on the logistical aspect. And as I remember from the discussions, it was brought up by one of uh, our expert uh, members. But yeah, I, I would say the intersection is, uh, is very important. Uh, they're, they're closely related. It's, it's a very crucial aspect of the, so the living systematic review, very important aspect of the living guideline. Great. And, and Hector, any other questions you can see or can I have another few comments? <laughs> please go ahead, Per, please go ahead. Yeah, so, so I think it's wonderful if the gene updating working group could take responsibility for also coordinating the actors in the evidence ecosystem here. We had a meeting last week with NICE and WHO in Australia, ALEC, the Living Evidence Consortium, and there's a need to develop a broader agenda for research and framework development and standards and checklists. And I think we all would welcome your working group, which is now very strong, uh, to take the leads and invite the actors. And I think we should quite rapidly have a meeting to come up with a kind of joint research agenda here. Like we're in Magic now supporting WHO and adaptation translation of living guidelines in the big project. And it's a massive challenge. So what do you do with a parent guideline that's living and then you have member states of WHO that has to adapt, translate a living guideline in a living format for their country. And 
just a bunch of key questions we have to uh, pursue. And I think uh, your this working group uh, is in a good position now, again, because you have some some strong people here and maybe with research interests as well to, to coordinate. So I welcome such an invitation. Yes, Bernard, we totally agree with this. And actually during the meeting that we have um, during the team conference, um, many questions came up and that's why and actually, before this, we even ran a uh, kind of like a questionnaire uh, with members uh, of the working group asking them uh, what topics were of interest to them. And definitely the first and foremost the topic uh, that was mentioned was the living, uh, living processes. Um, so we already have questions uh, that we would like to address and to ask uh, as part of this working group. And, and the collaboration, as you mentioned, would be just a perfect uh, way of um, finding common ground and working together. So by all means, um, yeah, I think, uh, and I think I speak on behalf of all of us here, um, we will be interested in um, pushing forward uh, with, with uh, these questions that you have and that we have and collaborating together. Super. Congratulations again, John. Wonderful work. Thank yes. you. Thanks for the very helpful feedback and questions raised. Yes, Joanne, we want to wholeheartedly thank you for this presentation, for this great work. Thank you for the time. Um, and for, for agreeing uh, and for being so um, so willing to help. And please also extend our uh, gratitude to, to Ellie. Um, we are almost out of time. Emma, would you like to say uh, some final thoughts before we close the meeting? Um, just, yeah, just to echo what everyone else has said. Thanks, thanks Juan, for sharing your work. Um, and it, it feels like it's created a lot of discussion, a lot of, um, opportunities to share our own experiences. So I think, um, thanks Per for your suggestion. We'll, we'll certainly take that forward and think about what the best next steps would be. Excellent. Well, thank you very much, uh, Joanne, Emma, and all of, all of you over here. And we look forward to staying in touch uh, with all of you. Uh, we'll probably the next step will be uh, sharing some, some some messages via email about next steps. Thank you again, everybody. Thank you, everyone. Thanks for arranging this. Thanks.